Hi, and welcome to our course notes on cell membranes and transport. We're not going to have a video that looks at each of the organelles that we have talked about in this class, but we are going to focus in particular on the cell membrane because of the important role that it plays in establishing the boundary of the living system and helping the living system to function as it does. In this video, we're going to talk about the structure of cell membranes in a very broad sense. We're going to talk about how membranes function to move materials into and out of cells, and it wouldn't be a starting video without a vocabulary word. So that term for that is what we call transport. And then how organisms both use the process of transport and how transport constrains what organisms can do. So this is a diagram of a typical cellular membrane. This is the plasma membrane or the membrane that's external to the cell. But really the composition of all membranes inside of eukaryotic cells are all the same in this overall structure. It's got a name, we call it the fluid mosaic model of the membrane. Fluid meaning that the components of it are able to move around within the membrane and mosaic like a mosaic picture or any other kind of composite image we have put together this membrane with different components. There are two main components that comprise a cell membrane. The first are phospholipids, which are a special type of fat. The term lipid is just the term for a particular fat. And so phospholipids have a particular organization. I've got a diagrammed one right here. So there's two major parts to the phospholipid, and I'm going to go ahead and illustrate them by just taking this phospholipid and representing it more diagrammatically. I've circled the top part of it, and that's what we call the phosphate head, and the phosphate head is attracted to water. It's what we say is hydro for water, philic, meaning it likes or is attracted to phyle, yeah? And then these orange structures that you see here are fatty acid tails. And these are going to be repelled from water. So they are hydro, you probably guessed it, but they're phobic or afraid of, not attracted to water. And this is all chemical, of course. The hydrophilic heads are chemically attracted to water and the tails are repelled. Zooming back out, you can see that in this diagram of the fluid mosaic model of the cell membrane, they've represented the phospholipid bilayer with these red, with these red circles with the orange tails coming off of them. And that's corresponding to the parts that we see in our diagram above. And when we put these phospholipids together, they're going to spontaneously organize themselves into a bilayer oriented like you see down below. A bilayer just means that there are two layers to the membrane because we've got a watery environment on one side of the cell membrane and we've got a watery environment on the other side of the cell membrane. So on the extracellular side and the intracellular side or the outside and the inside, generally speaking, there's a lot of water. And the phosphate heads of the phospholipids are going to orient themselves so that they're pointed towards the water. And then the tails are going to point inwards towards each other. And so we get that bilayer. The other part of the membrane, which is shown here in blue, is proteins. And those proteins play a variety of roles. We're only going to focus on a few of them in this class and in this video, but we should acknowledge that they're there. You can see them. There's a big blue one kind of in the middle right here, and we've got some other ones as well. And we're going to look at a couple of them and what they do. But this is the overall structure of the cell membrane. And because the cell membrane has this structure, it is able to allow certain things to pass through the membrane and other things not to. And that's a condition that we call semi-permeability. Now, semi-permeability is not really anything all that fancy. Uh, coffee filter is semi-permeable. It lets liquid through and keeps the grounds behind, and that's all just based on the size of the pores in the filter. The cell membrane is kind of like that, except it's probably a bit more fancy. Certainly size does play a role in what can go through, but it also the chemistry of molecules plays a role in what can go through. And we're not gonna get too deep into that in this video, but we should just recognize that some things have an easy time going through the cell membrane, particularly if they're small, and if they don't really, or if they aren't really attracted to water, and other things can't if they're too big or if they're too attracted to water to move to either side. We can still get them through, but there's gonna have to be some mechanisms to allow that to happen. We're now going to start to talk about those mechanisms, and so the main mechanism that is used by cells in order to control transport of materials is a process known as diffusion. And you can see that in this diagram up top. What we've done here is we've taken a beaker of water and we have put in some colored dye. And so over time, we're moving from the right to the left in this diagram. And we can see that the dye molecules start to spread out in the space. What the GIF is showing you is the same thing animated. 
Using this GIF, start at the bottom, where you can see that over time, the more purple area goes to where there's less purple. If we looked at this and looked at each individual molecule, we could see that where there are a lot of molecules to begin over on the left, they begin to spread out and occupy all of the space. But if you look at any individual molecule, one thing that's really interesting is you'll see that that individual molecule is not moving in any particular direction. It's not moving more to the right over time. This is because diffusion really only describes the behavior of groups of molecules or concentrations of molecules. And so in diffusion, things are going to go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And we get a little bit bored writing the word concentration over and over again. So in science, we'll usually put brackets around something like this in order to show that we're talking about concentration. We need to have a group of molecules in order to observe behavior because any individual molecule is only going to move randomly. It's only when you have a lot of molecules in one area that their random movement leads to them all spreading out. The other thing that's key about diffusion is that no energy is required. We don't need to put any energy in in order to get this to happen. All we need to do is have a lot of molecules in one area or really a lot of anything and just wait. And as long as we don't put any energy in over time, they will spread out. It's just what things do in this universe. It has to do with the laws of thermodynamics and uh, other reasons that we don't need to get into here, but it is a law of the universe that stuff will spread out if you don't put any energy into it. And it's just what happens. And diffusion is a major process that leads to the movement of stuff in cells. We can have simple diffusion, which is going through the cell membrane directly. So in this diagram, what we see are solute molecules, some sort of substance shown as the blue hexagrams, and they are moving from one side of the membrane to the other side over time. And they're going from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration until they are spread out. Of course, individual molecules will continue to move back and forth, but the overall net movement once we reach equal distribution will be for every one that moves one way, one will on average move the other way back and forth. Simple diffusion going through the membrane. Of course, if we have a lot of molecules on one side of the membrane and not a lot on the other, they might not be able to get through the membrane themselves. Because of their chemistry, because of their size, they might not be able to make that passage. In those cases, they're going to move through a protein channel. So that protein channel is going to be available and it's going to allow those molecules to go through. And you can see two different types of protein channels shown here. In both cases, these molecules are moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. But because their chemistry doesn't allow them to go through the phospholipid bilayer, they have to go through the proteins, which you see here in green. This is what we call facilitated diffusion because those proteins are making that happen. But we still don't need any energy. We're still going from high concentration to low concentration. It's just that this is happening through a facilitation of a protein. We won't really talk about the opposite in this class very much, but we should recognize that cells are not simply beholden to diffusional processes. Cells can move things in the opposite direction. They can move things from areas of low concentration to areas of high concentration. That's what we call active transport, and that requires an input of energy. In cells, as we'll talk about a bit later on in this course, the major energy storage and release molecule in cells is known as ATP. And you can see this ATP molecule here is going to undergo conversion to ADP here, and it is going to release a bit of energy that is going to be used by these proteins in here to move stuff against the concentration gradient. We would call these proteins pump proteins because just like if you were pumping air into a float or you're pumping water out of a leaking boat, you're taking stuff from an area of low concentration and moving it into an area where there's a lot of it and that's going to require an input of energy. We're going to see over and over and over again in this class various uses for diffusion, but I'm just gonna spotlight two here just to demonstrate how useful it is. The first is in our lungs. So inside of our lungs, we have hundreds of thousands of these units that you can see diagrammed here called alveoli. These are microscopic air sacs inside of our lungs. And what happens in these is that our respiratory gases are exchanged between the atmosphere and our bloodstream. If you look at the alveoli here, you can see that there's a network of capillaries surrounding it. And those capillaries are bringing blood over to the alveoli and then taking blood back from the surface of the alveoli. 
as the blood interacts with the air that's in the middle of the air sac here, the blood is going to exchange respiratory gases with it. Air that's coming into our lungs is bringing in oxygen, and it has more oxygen in it than the blood that's coming to the alveoli does. And so diffusion will allow for that oxygen to move into our blood. Similarly, the blood that's coming into our alveoli has a lot of carbon dioxide, and the air that we breathe in does not have very much at all. So as that oxygen diffuses into our blood, the carbon dioxide diffuses out of our blood into that air, and then we exhale that air outward. So that I'm not accused of being animal-centric all the time, I'll also point out that inside of roots, in plants, in the soil, we have diffusion of water, or what we would call osmosis. By maintaining a lower concentration of water in the root than is in the surrounding soil, water will, will passively move into plants at the root with no energy required other than the energy the plant needs just to maintain keeping less water inside of it than there is in the soil. These are just two examples of how diffusion is used. There are a lot of other ones too, and it's probably a good idea right now to pause the video and see if you can think of some other examples of places either in your body or in the larger living world where diffusion might be used to move stuff around different regions of a living system or from the inside of the living system to the outside or from the outside to the inside. Not a bad idea. Give that video a pause and do that right now. As we wrap up, I just want to talk about some of the constraints that transport puts on a living system. What we have in this diagram is the distance that it would take a particular molecule to diffuse and then the time that is required. And so we can see we have like an E. coli radius, which is about one millionth of a meter. If you took a meter and divide it into a million parts, one of those parts would be about the radius of an E. coli cell. It'll take a molecule on average about 10 milliseconds to diffuse that distance. Not so bad, right? 10 milliseconds is one hundredth of a second. Yeah, you can't really think at that speed. So it's pretty useful at that speed. We go up to a typical human cell. It's about 20 times larger than an E. coli. And now the time it takes is about 10 seconds. So it's about a thousand times slower as that distance goes up. If we go to the largest cellular structures that we know of, they're maybe about a centimeter, and we'd be waiting about 20 days. So if we wanted to think about what this looks like graphically, we can have this kind of axis here. We'll put size on our x-axis, and we'll put time on our y-axis. And it's not going to be a straight line like this. Instead, we would expect to see sort of an exponential increase. As the size of the object increases linearly, the amount of time necessary for diffusion to move substances through that object increases exponentially. The end result of this is that cells have to be small, right? They have no choice. They can't be big because if they get too big, they're not going to be able to move material throughout themselves efficiently. There's an upward limit on how big cells can be. Maybe a millimeter is about as big as we see most cells. The biggest cells are maybe a centimeter, but that's a very, very rare case. Most cells are considerably smaller than a millimeter. And the reason why is because diffusion really places an upward limit on how big cells can be before they become so inefficient that they can no longer sustain the life processes that keep them alive. As we wrap up this video, let's check our learning and make sure that we can do the following things. Make sure that you can explain how the structure of a cell membrane allows for the movement or the transport of material into and out of cells and all of those membrane bound organelles that we see inside of eukaryotic cells. Make sure that you can compare and contrast the processes of simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion and active transport. And finally, make sure that you can explain how transport is used by living systems with a couple of examples and ideally other examples than the ones that were just talked about in this video and how living systems are limited by processes like diffusion and transported materials. If you can do all those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment, pause the video, and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the help that you need. Thanks again for watching the video. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.